one of the questions I get asked a lot by students is, should I use a periodic boundary condition for this micro mechanical modeling or maybe a traditional Dirichlet power boundary condition? And I often will give them my suggestions of what I think they should do. But I think a more way to, correct way to answer this question is to actually do a literal experiment where we set up a model, one with a Dirichlet boundary condition, another one with a periodic boundary condition, generate stress and strain data from both setups and then see what we can learn by dealing with that. And that's what we're going to do in this video. If you want this sort of content, sit back and relax as we get started with it. So before we make the comparisons, what I really want to do is to go to some basic theory of what's really happening when you're thinking about Dirichlet and periodic boundary condition. And we'll start with what a Dirichlet, a Dirichlet boundary condition will look like. So basically we've got a representative volume element, which is a voided steel material that looks like this. It's got a length of 100 by 100. It's got small holes in them, which represent the voids. And this is sort of a boundary condition that you need to impose on the system like this to create unique cell deformation in the x-axis. So this is a boundary condition that you need to create a Dirichlet style boundary condition that will create um, axial deformation in the x-axis. So what does this mean? So we've got the back end with a roller support, the bottom end with a roller support. We've got a reference node that is away from the sample and I'm going to apply my load on that sample. And then once that load is applied on it, it will be kinematically tied to all the nodes on that front edge. So that when this system deforms, everything around it also will deform. And so there are these kinematic equations that can tell you a little bit more on how it's going on. But what we really want is the stress strain data. This is the, the, the parameters are important to get the stress strain data. So the surface area will be the area of that edge, which is the width times height. In this case, our depth or height is one because it's a 2D system. So our stress will be calculated as the reaction force of the return node of the reference node divided by the cross-sectional area. While the strain is the displacement of that reference node divided by the total length of the material. So this is how you get stress and strain data for a Dirichlet style boundary condition. On the other hand, when you have a periodic boundary condition, what do you do? So again, this is the domain we're looking at. In terms of the boundary condition for a Dirichlet, for a, a periodic boundary condition, we only work with the four nodes, the four corner nodes in the system. So again, whilst in the other case, we had a row of systems here, in this case, they are empty. So we'll just anchor that point, anchor this point using this boundary condition. And then we introduce a periodic boundary condition. So we use an algorithm and the algorithm that I use is an algorithm that I created called PPC Gen. If you're interested in it, please look in the description section of this video for this PPC Gen code that helps you to impose periodic boundary condition on this domain. And then once you impl implement that, then you note those return nodes or the corner nodes and as well, you apply displacement to one of the nodes, which will set the motion, trigger the motion for every other part of the model to give you this exact deformation that we want. So once we find that, the next thing is to look at a, a, a collection of three major categories of, of variables. The first one is the ones in green, which are the coordinate positions in X and Y of this system. Then we look at the reaction forces in X and Y, which is what I call FX and FXY, FY, in X and Y on the system and the displacements of those retained or corner nodes. So we've got all that assembly. So we're going to ask the model to give it to us. So in terms of what the model will give to us will be the coordinate positions, the displacement in X and Y and the reaction force in X and Y. So this is what we're going to ask Abacus or FA server to give us in order to do this. So how does that translate? So in terms of translating all that, so we've collected all that the only thing we're missing is a slave node because it's not doing anything. If you want to see how carefully you can generate, set these portals up and get generate stress and strain data from these two simulations, these two videos would help you do this. So this is a third in a series of videos I'm making on generating stress and strain data for digital and periodic boundary condition. And I'm making a comparison here. So these two videos will be very useful in helping you to do that. And whilst we are doing that, I just want to pause and, and, and ask, have you actually subscribed to this channel? You know, there's a lot of people that watch the content that I make that are actually not subscribed. My analytics says that 
close to 70% of you actually are not subscribed and you just come and watch. And, and, and I'm happy that you're engaging with the content, but I really would like you to subscribe if you haven't done so, so that at least when contents that I'm making like this become available, YouTube will sub, sub, uh, suggest that to you. And also it means that I'm continuing to build this community of people who are enthusiastic about computational modeling, especially working with Abacus and Final Element Modeling. So please do subscribe and do leave me a comment and share the content with your friends, with people you think you'll find them useful. The channel is growing a lot. I'm so grateful for your patronage. I'm so grateful for your support. And I'd like us to continue in this direction. So we're going to now go back to the video where I show you the comparison of plots that you generate based on these two approaches. So just to look at the sort of result that you get from the simulation. So when you set up the model, this is the kind of result you get for a Dirichlet based modeling. So where you've got the system anchored as we expected in the theory, this plant is acting a little bit away from the model as it's moving, the model is following it. And then you see fracture, doctor fracture being formed until it snaps into two. So this is a result, this contour plot from a Dirichlet based boundary okay. condition. And we can then extract the stress strain data, which we'll look at in a moment. So what about the PBC case? So for the periodic boundary condition, you get a similar sort of result. And it, again, there's a fracture. Fracture is happening at a different position. But if you just go back a bit and then see what we have here. So essentially, we've got the corner nodes clearly significant, specified as they should be with all, only the three of them in play. We've got the load that is applied directly onto it and it's moving the model. And then as we begin to move, you see just before at this point, you see a clear evidence of periodicity of material as we expect. So you've got the cyclic behavior at this end and also the same cyclic behavior at that end. So periodic boundary condition is working. The model is doing everything as we want to. And then until you get eventual failure, and the system continues to be intact. So we're happy with the nature of our simulations. Now, what final thing we need to do is to get, get the stress strain data. And so when you get the stress strain data, which again, you can pick up from these two videos. So this is the sort of result that you're going to get. So what we have here is that the green line is for the Dirichlet based boundary condition. The X, the red line is called the periodic boundary condition. And you can see some really interesting result that you find here. And if you look at the, the data that you get from it, so the Young's modulus for the Dirichlet boundary condition is 200. The Young's modulus for the PBC base is 156. And considering that this material is made of steel that has a Young's modulus of 210 gigapascal. So the DBC seems a little bit more stable. It's getting you the answer that you want. That of PBC is quite way far, way off. There's a lot of reasons why this can be the case. I think the mesh that I've used in this model is not very fine. And so it's not tracking the behavior effectively well. It could also mean that maybe we need to control the number of times that we allow in this linear elastic region because there's few elements there so that energy can be dissipated effectively in that linear elastic region. But at least we are getting some stress strain data and we're getting this all we want. If you then look at the effective yield strength, which is the ultimate tensile strength of this material, again, with the TBC, you're getting 300. With the X tensile, you're getting a little bit lower than that. Okay? And what is basically saying, this is the maximum value in the model. Okay? So again, for this material, its ultimate tensile strength is in the yield region is probably around 300 megapascals. So the DBC is also doing a very good job for this, okay, compared to this other thing. And remember, this is just only one simulation. So the other thing you notice is that there's more ductile damage energy dissipation for a DBC-based system as against a periodic boundary condition-based system. But you get the same trend of behavior. The systems are dissipating energy or some kind of non-linearity in the fracture region and everything looks as expected and it, it looks correct. So what conclusions can we draw from that? There's really not a lot of conclusion that we can make draw from this without some sort of systematic study to see what is really going on. What I would then need to do is to do a real mesh dependent study so that you get traces like this to make sure that it's not as a result of the mesh that you're using. 
and also get to a point where the young smudges and the yield strength are independent of the mesh. That is only when you can see and make a definitive statement as to which one to use. But I think what's more relevant to say is that each of these approaches are quite viable in themselves if you set them up properly in, in terms of generating the result that you want. They actually had different fracture patterns at the end, even though they're exactly the same model. But effectively, they work well, and whichever one you decide to use is very appropriate for your setup, especially if you use this type of directional boundary condition that I've used here. So that's what I want to say. say. Again, if you want to look at those two videos that I made to show exactly how you get this independent plot before we make the comparison, these are the videos that can help you to do that. Thank you for interest in this channel, and I'll see you in the next. Bye-bye.